Good morning, everybody. Nice to see people out on this nice warm morning. <laughs> Anybody else sick of winter? I certainly am. Um, my name is Cheryl Paradowski. I'm the National President and CEO for the Supply Chain Management Association. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning to SCMA's Green Shipper Survey Seminar. Um, the Green Shipper Survey was conducted for SCMA by Dr. Garland Chow, who is going to share the results of the survey with you this morning and discuss the implications for shippers and carriers. If you have not yet had the opportunity to participate in the survey, the links do remain open for a short period of time and we'll make sure that they're shared following the meeting. Also, because of the number of people here, we would like to keep this an interactive, more of a dialogue session. So we would invite your questions as we go along, and then we'll certainly have a formal question and answer period at the end. So I am going to start off by introducing Dr. Garland Chow, who is actually the chair of SCMA's Education Committee, and he's also an appointed director on our board. He is currently the Associate Professor in Operations and Logistics Division, and Director of the Bureau of Intelligent Transportation Systems and Freight Security at the University of British Columbia's Sauter School of Business. Dr. Chow teaches and writes in the fields of supply chain, business logistics, and freight transport management, and is a member of several editorial boards. He also serves on the, uh, the accreditation review panel of the Canadian Supply Chain Sector Council. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Garland Chow. Well, it's a, uh, I will, oh, I'm, I should be pointing that away. Well, okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. So um, I just want to tell you that uh, today is the last day of this tour, and I'm going straight home. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you know, in the last 20 years, we've only observed one thing, and that is freight transportation is going up, up, and up. At the same time, the most fuel-intensive form of transportation is trucking. And in fact, trucking has become 40% more efficient. It uses less fuel. Unfortunately, the growth in freight is much more than the efficiency of trucking. And as a consequence, the emissions going into the air have just grown. And so we need to do something. Um, and there are many things to do, and that's why we had the Green Shipper Survey. It's a survey which was intended to find out what are the practices that are being utilized by you folks, by your colleagues and peers. What are the best practices and most frequently used practices to reduce fuel emissions, reduce, fuel, uh, uh, reduce air emissions, and reduce fuel use? Um, but you know, there's more to it than just the techniques. What are the motivations of the companies? What are the barriers? Uh, what is the position and vision and, and, and commitment to sustainability in companies? All of this has an impact on the degree to which uh, there is adoption of sustainable practices in transportation companies and in transportation functions. You can find the detailed demographics in the actual report. Basically, Today, I'm going to talk about the results of about uh, of 169 responses that were received by the first week of February. They represent companies that are operating in Canada. Some are business units of larger companies or global companies. Others are uh, dom uh, domestic Canadian companies. And these companies, their dominant movement is within Canada. They also have a substantial north, south, and cross-border movement. Some ship overseas, and they do represent the full range of business types, several, all the different manufacturing sectors, retailing, wholesaling, and the service sector, as well as uh, uh, both large and small companies. One important demographic, though, is to what degree is transportation managed by these companies? And as you can see here, the, uh, most of the companies 51% and 30%, that's 80% of the companies, do purchase transportation. They're purchasing for higher transportation, and that is an important area to manage with respect to sustainability. Uh, in our particular sample, 35% uh, actually operate some type of private uh, fleet, uh, most of that being, of course, private trucking. 
Well, let's get right to it. Let's get right to it. And what we did was we asked all the respondents the, uh, to what degree they are either utilizing or planning to implement 26 different well-known transportation management strategies which would reduce fuel use and reduce emissions into the air. And we ranked them. Uh, this is a picture of it, but let's recognize that the number one the number one strategy by a, f by a large margin is the consolidation of shipments and load uh, maximization. In other words, let's get as much freight as we can into every vehicle or container that moves, and the more we get in there, the less vehicle trips we have to make. The less vehicle miles that are traveled, the less fuel that's going to be used. That's number one. At the far, at the other end, are uh, is our, our uh, alternatives such as provide a power source for aux auxiliary uh, units uh, uh, for, uh, for, our trail, uh, for um, power units when they are doing pickup and deliveries. And of course, uh, this is a small percent, uh, but of course we should recognize that not every company has the opportunity to do this. In some of our case studies we found that companies have drop and pick operations. They don't have live loading, so this is not applicable. Now what I'm going to do is, take uh, now, uh, and one last thing I want to note before we move off of this slide. Notice that, notice that the two strategies that have to do with transportation sourcing, transportation sourcing are, include CO2 sustainability in sourcing the carriers and encourage carrier suppliers to be CO2 sustainable. Well, these two are basically number 21 and 22 out of 26. They are on the low end of the scale. They are one of the least frequently utilized in this survey. Let's reorganize this, and the way I'm going to reorganize it is the following. Let's take all of the tactics, all the techniques that are related to maximizing loads and capacity utilization. When we look at that, we recall that the number one strategy is consolidate shipments and load maximization. Uh, the other t uh, two more in this category, backhauling to minimize empty miles and transloading, they, they're, they're significantly less, but of course they represent situations that only some carriers, some shippers, have an opportunity to take advantage of. For example, transloading, well, the transloading is primarily in the area of um, inbound shipments from Asia or another offshore country. Typically that freight is coming in 40 and 45 foot ocean containers which, um, which will carry a certain amount of, of freight at a certain density. When they get to North America or to Canada, the best way to move them is on 53 foot high cube containers uh, or, or trailers. Um, and so um, in order to effectively move them within the country, within Canada, they would be transloaded from the ocean containers, and typically it's a three to two ratio. Okay. One other point within this category is that transportation management software that's utilized to maximize loads and reduce vehicle miles, you notice that this is ranked relatively low. What that tells me is that you don't have to have sophisticated software to implement many of these strategies here. It just takes good um, brain power in many cases. The second category, so by the way, in that first category, in that first category, what are you doing? Again, by loading as much as possible into any particular vehicle, trailer, or container, what you're doing is reducing the number of trips that are being taken. The second category is, well, we have to make the trip, but let's make sure it's rooted uh, as optimally as possible so you minimize the number of miles or kilometers driven and by doing that again you reduce fuel, util uh, fuel use and emissions into the air. Now uh, interestingly these uh, in this category these three uh, strategies in this category are in fact number two, number three, and number four in terms of strategies most frequently utilized to be more sustainable. Number two being well, let's just move directly. Move uh, shipments directly to reduce miles. Let's uh, reduce empty container, uh, uh, manage our containers and our empties where they're moving, and to route trips and schedule, uh, to route the trips so they have an optimum uh, route configuration. And then the third category 
is mode substitution. And this one's pretty obvious. Let's go to a form of transportation that utilizes less fuel and therefore emits uh, less um, uh, uh, pollutants into the air. Uh, increased utilization of fuel efficient modes such as rail, sea, intermodal, as opposed to uh, utilizing the more, uh, uh, the less fuel efficient, uh, basically, trucks. Um, one, one uh, the, 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 this strategy here, modifying scheduling to enable optimal loading, this seems to be very important, particularly in the case studies that we, done, we did. Why? Because in many cases, in order to utilize uh, a slower form of transportation, such as intermodal or uh, rail, uh, rail boxcar, what that means is that, yes, the tra the, uh, you're, you're going to now satisfy your customer less. But sometimes the customer doesn't understand um, why, the, um, why the freight uh, you know, can move more slowly, but still, still uh, get there on time. I, I guess it's sort of like the uh, FedEx commercial. In the FedEx commercial, you might recall, this gentleman walks into a room, uh, a warehouse, and he looks at all the clocks. And he notices, notices that every clock is a half an hour uh, fast. He says, it's, it's, it's not you know, 11.30, it's, it's just 11 o'clock right now. And then, of course, the uh, people who had been working there for a number of years explained to the fellow that, well, you know what? Uh, things are so unreliable here, we just do everything a half an hour faster. In some ways, in some ways, that's what intermodal transportation means. That is, or, or rail transportation means. Uh, over the last several decades, um, uh, those modes of transport have become more reliable, but they're still going to be slow. Uh, and so, as long as you can plan for that, as many companies can do uh, through scheduling and um, uh, so on, it might enable more optimum loading. In other cases, it it might be the um, the uh, shipper can talk to customers and ask them, well, uh, can you order slightly larger shipments? That'll allow us to utilize a different form of transport that'll be more fuel efficient. What I think you, what you need to do here is that there are in that list that you can look up in the uh, uh, survey summary, many different alternatives. And the questions you should always be asking are, have we left any of the opportunities in this, in this category uh, unlooked at or unutil unutilized? Have we left some low-hanging fruit on the tree, as they often say? And in many cases, what you will find is that it may pay for itself in terms of productivity and cost reduction. The icing on the cake is that how will it impact greenhouse gas uh, emissions? <clears throat> on the fleet management side, <clears throat> All these strategies we just talked about were, were with respect to purchasing for higher transportation. On the fleet management side, we also asked about 22 different uh, strategies. What you will find is that the top, in the top 10 strategies, most of these, most of these are not let's make an investment in new equipment, let's make an investment in uh, 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 new equipment or additions to the vehicles. Most of these are managerial and behavioral. Change your drivers. Change attitudes. Um, uh, um, uh, use software that will allow us to make better decisions. So if you look at the number one um, <coughs> implemented strategy uh, in uh, the uh, fleet management, it's fleet management systems. It's flexible loading and receiving schedules. It's driver training. Well, yes, number four, use speed governors. That's a technology uh, one. Reduce highway speeds using better training and rules. Idle reduction technology. Improve freight logistics, load matching. So in every case, all these are managerial techniques, not ones that require a large investment. And we'll come back to that theme in a few moments. Okay. On the uh, low end, the, the, the uh, least frequently utilized methods, they include many, many um, uh, strategies that do employ, do require some investment in changing the equipment. So if you look down here, it might be different types of tires, tire inflation systems, electrifying at truck stops, reducing the weight of the vehicle, 
uh, switching fuels and so on. These are substantial changes in the way in which a company may operate as opposed to the most frequently utilized ones which are managerial in nature. Now, most of the actual summary report has all of these techniques. I want to concentrate on something different, and that is, well, will a company actually utilize these? To do that, we asked four questions to identify the vision that a company has with respect to sustainability, the commitment that a company has with respect to sustainability, the degree to which an economic ROI is required before you would take on a sustainability project, and the degree to which you educate your employees about the importance of sustainability. The first question, vision. Does a company, do you believe, the respondent believes that the company has a vision and mission that includes the reduction of greenhouse gases? And what you find is the following. Yes, the majority, 20 and 26, that's 46 percent, exceed those who disagree, which is 29 percent. However, there's about a quarter sitting on the fence in the middle. What about the commitment of senior management? Again, we find the same thing. That's 47 percent that agree or strongly agree, as opposed to 30 percent that disagree, and again, about a quarter in the middle. What about return on investment? Now, this is actually a reverse question. We often do this in order to ensure that, yes, the person isn't just going like this and clicking, clicking, clicking. And what we find is the following. Remember, this says, this says, look, if we're going to make an investment in sustainability, if we're going to make an investment in sustainability, must it have a return on investment? Must it have? And so if you agree or strongly agree, then you're saying, Yes, it must have a return on investment. Yes, even though we might have the commitment, even though we might have the vision, we're saying that economics trumps sustainability. We're saying that, yes, we value sustainability. Yes, we're committed. But if it doesn't earn a rate of return on investment, we're not going to do it. So this is the group. Strongly disagree or um, disagree. Only, only 19% are putting their, you know, their actions were, um, you know, in front of money. Whereas most, the overwhelming 50% say, no, it has to have an economic rate of return. And again, there's 31%, a substantial, you know, more than a quarter in this case, that's sitting in the middle. Now, um, and then finally, with respect to education of employees, this one is a, um, a standoff. 36% agree, 36% disagree, and again, about a quarter or more right in the middle. We'll come back to this. We'll come back to it by asking ourselves, so, so, are these companies, do they have alignment? Alignment in terms of, does vision and commitment, are they aligned? Is vision and the uh, return on investment that's required, is that aligned? Is vision and the education of employees, is that a line? What we find is this. What we find is that, well, only 40% actually have alignment between vision and commitment. I am both committed and, uh, and we have the vision. 28% are not aligned. They say one, but don't do the other. And 30% are sitting on the fence because they, they neither agree or disagree on one or both of the uh, statements. Similarly, and this is the most striking, the alignment between vision and the requirement of a return on investment, there's only 5%, less than 5% alignment. Only f less than 5% of the respondents say, yes, yes, we want to do it, but we have to have an ROI. We have to have an ROI. 56% are not aligned, and 40% are on the border. And uh, as we said, the, uh, there's kind of a balance, a balance within education. Does a company have the vision, 65 and 50, as opposed to 36 and 30? Is a company, senior management, committed, 61 and 55 versus 50 and 31? Must you have an ROI? 
Darn right, 80 and 56, as opposed to 35 and 61 for the larger companies. And are you providing your employees with information? Yes, 50 and 45 versus only 30 and 20. So size does make a difference. So let's now be more direct. Let's look at this commitment or vision or ROI requirement and the actual implementation of those transportation emission uh, reduction initiatives. What we've done here is taken the top five, just the top five of the transportation management initiatives. This is not fleet. This is uh, for higher transportation. In the top five, whoops, uh, actually I should go back here. What you will see is this. We correlated that with whether the company had the vision or not, had the vision for sustainability. And what you see is that consistently that, look, if 57% um, uh, of the respondents who, in fact, uh, uh, consolidate loads and have that vision, only 32%, but 32% still do that, but don't have the vision. With regards to route planning and scheduling, 54%. With respect to more direct shipments, 54%, 57%, 47%. And if they don't have the vision, if they don't have, uh, if, if, and as far as not having the vision, a small percent do not implement. So this is pretty consistent. But the next thing to notice is that even though they don't have the vision, many of the companies still implement, still implement many of these measures here. Why? Is there something else going on? Of course there is. It does increase productivity. It does reduce miles. It does reduce fuel, it doesn't necessarily have to reduce emissions. So many of these uh, highly utilized techniques are ones in which um, they would have done anyway just as a good, uh, just for good transportation management. In contrast, in contrast, if you go to the bottom five, the bottom five, we again find the same pattern in that if they have the vision, you will implement as opposed to not implement. 48% will implement as opposed to 12% who dot, do not implement. 38 versus 19, 52 versus 9. Um, okay. Now, in contrast, in contrast, if they don't have the vision, they don't implement. So in other words, look, only a small percent, 13% implement even though they don't have the vision, as opposed to that larger percent in the previous one. And, and so on. So uh, as you see here, then, these are all small percentages, which says what? Probably these, and you can think of these in your own operations, these strategies may not reduce costs, may not improve service, may not increase productivity anyway, and therefore they're not going to be implemented unless, unless there is a vision for sustainability to get that benefit as well. Well, remember, I've already mentioned that in these strategies, sourcing strategies, those two are ranked very low. Does it make a difference? Well, we've already said that, yes, if you source from rail or intermodal as opposed to truck, of course, you're using a more efficient form of transport in terms of fuel usage and therefore lowering emissions. But there can be a substantial, a significant difference in the uh, utilize in, in emissions and therefore in fuel efficiency between carriers, between transportation companies within the same category. Now, what I've done here is taken information from SmartWay. And what SmartWay does is the following. First of all, they want to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. And so for in the trucking sector, they divide trucking into 11 categories, and those are actually subdivided into for hire and private. So here's the category, truckload dry van for hire. And we measure here the CO2 emissions in grams per kilometer traveled, kilometer traveled. They take all the carriers in this category, rank them from best to worst, and then cut them off at 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%. So there are five categories or bins, or bins. Bin five 
is the worst performing category with respect to emissions. They are emitting, this carrier, on average, this is the average within the category, are emitting uh, nearly 1,200 grams of CO2 into the air for every kilometer traveled. In contrast, uh, uh, a BIN 4 carrier is emitting less than 1,200, a BIN 3 carrier a little over 1,000, a BIN 2 carrier less than 1,000, and the BIN 1 carrier, the highest category, 931 grams as opposed to 1179 there. Now I'm going to put this in pictures. What that says is the following. If you currently are using a carrier in the bin 5 category or a non-smart weight carrier that might even be lower, then you're emitting a certain amount of carbon. Uh, you're causing the emitting of a certain amount of carbon into the air. If you, however, switch to a carrier in the bin 4 category, you will improve, you will improve, you will reduce emissions by 6%. If you move to a bin 3 category, the cumulative reduction in emissions is 11%. If you move to a bin 2, it's 18. If you move to bin 1, it's 24%. It's 24%. That's a significant difference. Well, Yeah, the homogeneity in, in this uh, does not account for length of haul uh, in this case. It's, uh, it's, it's the type of freight being moved and the type of equipment. So this would be truckload freight, dry van. I think in general these categories, however, do uh, end up um, with the majority of the carriers being either long distance uh, or, or, or short. So for example, this is a DeRay category. Obviously none of them are going uh, long distance. They're all short haul, um, okay? But that's a good question. Uh, perhaps that's something for improvement. And oftentimes that improvement comes with greater numbers of carriers participating, and then you can start segmenting them. Now, that was per kilometer traveled. What if you have freight that's high density? Then you're, you, you, you might be more interested in ton kilometers ton kilometers, and this is the same category, truckload dry van for hire, and uh, without going over the numbers down here, what we find is that the difference, the difference with respect to emissions per ton kilometer that recognizes the weight of the shipment as well, can be 45, up to 45 percent difference. The point I'm making here is that choosing between different carriers can make a big, big difference in the emissions that, uh, that go into the air because of your choice of transportation carrier. Now, if we go back to the survey, even though, even though the two sourcing, the two sourcing transportation management techniques are low on the totem pole, they are high on the plan to implement, which is reason for optimism. And perhaps it reflects some of the trends I'm going to talk about in a few moments. And that is uh, more than the number they're implementing are actually planning to implement strategies in this area to reduce emissions. That would bring this up to double, up to double, you know, up to 40%. So we ask ourselves the question, what is it? What is it that's preventing uh, carriers from doing so? To investigate that, we first of all start with if you as a carrier, excuse me, if a shipper is actually purchasing transportation and implementing and so using sourcing, what are they requiring from the carriers? And I have a list here and you can see the details in uh, the report, but I'm going to summarize it for you real quick. They are weak. They are not asking much. They are, how about the word wimpy? They are wimpy. Look, look at the number one, by far number one, um, um, criterion or um, strategy. CO2 emission reduction has some importance, but cost, quality, and service will dominate the purchase decision. So it's a very weak requirement. We'll choose a carrier with better CO2 qualifications or performance when other factors are equal. When are other factors going to be equal? Will they really be? Uh, so that's a really 
uh, uh, unusual circumstance anyway. You will ask if the carrier has a CO2 reduction program in place or in development in order to bid for the traffic. Good, you're doing something. Don't tell us what you're doing. Just tell us you're doing something. Use CO2 qualifications or performance as a factor in the scorecard and evaluation used in carrier selection. Now we're getting a little tougher. But, we're also a sm but it's also a smaller number of carriers. In fact, if we we're go to go down the bottom, the real test the real test is, are we willing to pay more to a carrier with a better CO2 re uh, um, uh, reduction performance? Only 10% say that. And so, again, what we see here is that economics trumps sustainability in the sense that, yes, we may recognize it. Yes, we re require that you are uh, you're, uh, trying to do something, you have some type of program, but when push comes to serve, it's still price or cost, quality and service, and sustainability is sort of the icing on the cake if you can get it. We, um, uh, that's the same thing. We um, then also asked, now, what do you do? What do you do when you actually um, require a, a uh, emission reduction program, what do you do in terms of managing that, in terms of requiring some type of compliance? Now remember, only a small number of carriers, uh, you know, a smaller percentage actually require some type of uh, compliance program. So there's really only, I believe it's 28 respondents in this section here. But what they say is interesting. Uh, we send CO2 sustainability questionnaires in order to monitor the compliance. We monitor our carrier's compliance with their CO2 sustainability requirements. We monitor our carrier's commitment to CO2 sustainability. So they're doing all of this, but all of this takes time. All of this takes effort. And that's the theme I want to go on to right now uh, uh, after uh, we look at this. And that is, now, are these companies, what are their motivations? What are their motivations for implementing some type of CO2 reduction program in their transportation management area. And the top three, we can either look at the table or we can look at this chart right here, which says that the top three or actually top four would be achieving financial return, achieving savings, and then the, the next two are public relations and uh, getting market share. So the top two are economic. The top two are saying we need to have an ROI. The top two are we need to reduce costs. However, however, this question says it's of high importance. If we were, if we were to ask or put together high importance and medium importance, look what jumps to the top. Improving public relations, meeting customer demand for, uh, for sustainability. So these really are important but they're secondary. When you put them together as you know, the most important and important, they in fact outrank even a return on investment. The last question that's asked in the survey, or one of the last questions is, in the next three years, how important will reducing greenhouse gas emissions such as CO2 be in your company? One said it'll become number one, uh, uh, one company or two companies said it'll be number one. 57% said it'll become more important. Now that's a, another important sign because what we've done here is the following. Remember those four questions about vision, commitment, ROI, and education. What we did was it was around 47% that said our companies will have the vision. We then, we then calculated the number of respondents, the number of surveys where they said, no, we don't have the vision. We disagree. We don't have the vision. And it will become more important. And so by taking those two together, it's possible that nearly 66% of this sample, and if they're representative, this is very positive, are going to have the vision. Actually, I'm sorry, I should be down here. 72% will have the vision. Doing the same thing for commitment, 70% may have the vision. Doing the same thing for 
Um, uh, having a return on investment, well, uh, if, if we believe that if, you know, they're going to be in alignment, it could be 67%, and with respect to education, 66%. So this is positive. It's positive in that many of these uh, companies are seeing sustainability as being more important or becoming the most important. As a consequence of that, when you put that together, when you put that together with what the, the companies who already have the vision, already have the vision uh, uh, percentage, when you add that together, a substantial number of you folks and a substantial number of companies in Canada will have the vision, be committed, will not require as stringently a return on investment and will educate their employees. So we've already mentioned that sourcing transportation, carrier sourcing management um, is low on the totem pole now, much more of it's being planned, and we've identified that, that many of these companies are having uh, need information in order to manage. In fact, the, uh, uh, that, but what they're doing now is that the green requirements and incentives are relatively weak. Very few have an emissions management program. And the conclusion that I come to is that perhaps measuring emissions compliance is a barrier to effective carrier management. After all, if you can't measure, measure performance, you can't management, uh, manage it. So we've already said this, that uh, many of the companies plan to implement, and perhaps it's because they are beginning to be, they're able now to measure it and therefore manage it. We've already said that there are striking differences in carrier emissions performance. We've indicated that, um, uh, well, in fact, there may be, uh, from the last question, um, sustainability and the importance of emissions is becoming stronger. You know, you know, and many companies have observed that customers are more demanding about you being sustainable. There's a recognition that there are, uh, that in this world that you should be managing your scope three emissions as well as your scope one and scope two. Now, these, these are now globally accepted uh, concepts about emissions. Scope one are the emissions that you generate in your own internal operation. Scope two are the emissions that are generated because you utilize coal for fuel as opposed to hydroelectric or as opposed to wind power, if that's economic. Scope three, however, is the emissions generated by your suppliers. And for many years, we would just raise our hands and say, we can't manage that. We can't manage it because we can't measure it. We can't get the information. So we just give up. Should you give up? No. I think we've already indicated there is, there is a, uh, uh, changes now in terms of the ability to uh, measure that. Some of the other reasons why transportation sourcing should be, uh, could be implemented is that there's a greater linkage between emissions and, uh, and uh, uh, customer demand and therefore sales. There is the potential for carbon pricing. Many companies have, have st uh, think strategically. And their strategic thinking is that sooner or later there will be some type of cost to emitting pollutants. We already have that in BC where there is a carbon tax. Uh, it, it's only one of the few jurisdictions that have that. But many companies are thinking strategically and asking themselves if there was a carbon tax, if there is um, um, carbon trading, uh, uh, which, which, there actually, uh, which there actually is, if, they ha if that occurs, what if, what if uh, fuel prices rise all of a sudden? What are the risks or opportunities that arise from that? The only way to manage that is to, in fact, know what the carbon emissions are. So as an example, Canadian Tire has a group that measures carbon shadow prices. That is, they have measured their emissions in sourcing, in their retail operations, in their transportation, and in other areas, and then ask themselves if there is a tax on carbon, 
Where are we emitting all this carbon? And therefore, is this a risk that we have to be ready for? Or is it an opportunity because we're already very efficient in that area? But perhaps the more important reason why uh, transportation sourcing can be used as a tool for managing emissions is the fact that we can, there, because, is the fact that the measurement of CO2 has improved substantially. How, can that, how has that been improved? Uh, it's basically one in which um, many shippers have been asking for emissions in the past. But asking and getting are two different things. Asking a number of carriers, you might get some this week, some a month from now, so you can't put it together at the proper time. You may be getting it in different formats. You may be getting it, uh, the information uh, in, um, uh, uh, from different sources that are not consistent. Uh, you don't know if they're valid or transparent. Uh, at the same time, I think many carriers want to provide that information, but many have difficulty in doing so. Fortunately, third parties have stepped in. Third parties can be in the private sector, and they can be in the public sector. The third party, in essence, creates a network effect. That third party provides a single method, a standard method for defining what emissions are and collecting them and disseminating them. The network effect works here. The network effect is one in which I'm a carrier. I get requests from, carrier, from shippers all the time for carbon. Instead, uh, uh, instead of providing each individual, uh, meeting each individual request, if they work through a third party, a hub, then when they submit the information once, it can be seen by an infinite number of shippers who need that information. Similarly, if I'm a shipper and I go to this third party or hub, when I go to them, I have access to all of the suppliers who submit information to that third party. What are the choices? In our survey, we did try to get a feel for the different ways in which carbon is measured by shippers. The fleet, uh, you know, Natural Resources Canada's Fleet Smart program uh, existed for a number of years and it may still exist, uh, so some companies rely on that. <clears throat> Smartway, a number of companies mentioned that, but the majority say that it's calculated in house. It's calculated in house. Well, obviously, if it's calculated in-house, that presents some difficulties for someone who wants to compare apples to apples as opposed to app uh, end up with apples against oranges. So let's focus for a moment on one of those third parties, the uh, public sector, the SmartWay program. In the SmartWay program, the suppliers of transportation services are segmented into third-party logistics companies or logistics companies, into multimodal carriers, uh, uh, truck and rail intermodal, into rail itself, and into trucking companies. The trucking companies are divided into 13 separate categories so that uh, there's more homogeneity between them with respect to the conditions in which they operate. By the way, and I shouldn't have put that there, but just without before you came in here, before you came in here, how many of you actually heard of SmartWay? Okay, so what I see here is about, I'm going to say, about a third. And that's exactly what we saw in the sur survey, but fortunately I think that uh, now everybody here and in the survey has heard about SmartWay. Um, <clears throat> one point I should make is that you don't have to be a SmartWay member to utilize SmartWay. So for example, Hudson's Bay, are they here today? Okay, Hudson's Bay, uh, 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 Ms. Ven Ven Venslo Viatis uh, mentions that, look, we can go to the SmartWay website and identify carriers who are participating in SmartWay. Automatically, you, now, you could, for example, if you want to use this as a criterion, reduce the companies to which you, set, you send an RFP to. And um, in Nature's Path, Nature's Path is like many um, companies. Their core, their core is to make this organic product. 
It's to make it. They do have a logistics department. The logistics department, number one, takes care of strategy for logistics, distribution network planning, the operation of the distribution center, but the transportation and its management is outsourced, in this case to C.H. Robinson. C.H. Robinson themselves are a SmartWay partner and Nature's Path, and we're going to go over their case study in a moment, Nature's Path can work with C.H. Robinson to achieve their sustainability goals and let the SmartWay member, C.H. Robinson, take care of that. Okay. Well, we're going to hear Dave later, so I'll skip this. <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> so, here is a quote that came in January in Vancouver. Green initiatives must be viable. Now, this is with reference to the, um, the uh, plan to set up a bicycle system in Vancouver, and one of the suppliers went bankrupt. And so uh, even though Vancouver is green, even though many of the people profess this and that, we're not going to spend our tax money on a bicycle system. We're not going to do that unless it can make money in its own right. Well, does that apply? Does that apply? to the uh, initiatives that you can take as a shipper to be more sustainable? Well, I'd like to tell you that it probably doesn't, uh, it probably doesn't make any difference. And what I mean by that is, that, uh, is, is shown in this survey here. This survey, by the way, is of two types of respondents. Members of the Carbon Disclosure Project, which includes mostly Fortune uh, five, uh, 100 firms or equivalent like the Walmarts, the Nestle's, uh, PepsiCo, and so on, and their suppliers, their suppliers. This chart reflects the members, reflects responses from the members. And what the question was this, what type of sustainability emission initiatives receive what type of payback? The number one category is behavioral change. Educate your employees. Change their attitude. Have them always thinking about sustainability when they make decisions. No question they are number one. But number two is fugitive emissions. Yes, there's gas leaking into the air. There's oil spilling on the ground. But look at number three and number four. Number three is transportation use. That's for higher transportation. 33% have a payback of one year or less, and 50% have a payback between one and three years. In other words, 88% of the initiatives taken by these companies, 88 per, excuse me, 83% of these initiatives have a payback of three years or less of forgetting the value of money, 33% ROI or better. 33% ROI or better for transportation for higher in, in, uh, initiatives. With respect to fleet initiatives, 33% are getting a one-year payback, and other 17% are getting a one- to three-year payback, or 50% in total. The suppliers to the CDP uh, members, the suppliers, again, behavioral change is the number one initiative to be taken. But transportation use for higher transportation, fully 65% of the initiatives taken have a one-year payback. Another 19% have a one- to three-year payback. 84% of the initiatives taken have a payback of three years or less. So there are many initiatives that uh, can be taken. It's proven. It's shown. Uh, you know, the, the experience is that uh, there's a lot of perhaps low-hanging fruit out there that can be taken advantage of that will reduce emissions but have a payback, a real payback, to make it economically feasible. Well, that's the end of the survey itself.